welcome back to another edition of Songs of the Ozarks, a project of the Ozark Studies Institute, an ongoing initiative of the Missouri State University Libraries. My name is Emily Flatness, and today's date is April 12th, 2023. We are here at Missouri State University in the Ozarks room um, in our library, and the special guest today is Justin Larkin. Howdy. <laughs> Thank you so much for meeting with me today. Yeah, this is going to be so much fun. Would you mind playing us a song I before we get to. started? Uh, here's a song called uh, When You Are Down. Up at night sometimes I wonder What it is you're dreaming about Do you wake up in the morning fighting monsters Or are you flying before you hit the ground? The night before last, I buried a butterfly At the highest point of the tallest mountain range Cause the sky is a stranger to wings that are broken But when you are down bad dream and she said I woke up fighting monsters and I was like well let's write a song about it because that's pretty poetic <sighs> that so, is so good and the part about was it eating a butterfly I buried it so like, I buried a butterfly so that one was um we came home from the hospital after we had had our daughter and I found this butterfly on the sidewalk that had died and something compelled me to bury it in the backyard I don't know why and then I decided to sing about it. It's a total literal thing that I did. A lot of people think it's a metaphor, but I mean, it is, but it's, I guess, a physical metaphor. Right. I don't know what it means. <laughs> so do you mostly perform originals? Yeah. Well, I do a lot of covers at, like, oh, some sweet. of the brewery gigs and stuff. Like, I like to read the room, you know? Sometimes if, like, somebody walks in with, like, a band shirt on, I'm like, I know a song by that band. I'll start playing it, you know? But I'll do whatever. I, I like to do other people's songs in my songs. Whatever the moment calls for. So, tell me a little bit about um, where you grew up. Did you grow up in the Ozarks? Yeah. 
definitely. I uh, was born in California, and then I moved to Max Creek, Missouri in 1992 when I was about a year and a half old. And I lived there until after I was done with kindergarten, and then I moved to Greenfield. I lived in Greenfield from first through fifth grade, and then I moved to Nevada, and I lived in Nevada from uh, sixth grade till a year after I graduated high school. Wow. And those are all relatively rural communities, correct? Yeah. yeah, different small towns all around here. It's funny, I always joke that Springfield is kind of like where everybody from the small towns goes. Like It's like a small town so refugee camp. So true. <laughs> <laughs> Um, did your family, anyone in your family play music, ancestors? I was told that my grandmother had something to do with vaudeville, but any of my immediate family didn't really touch a whole lot of music other than like uh, an appreciation for it. For really? Sure. So what kind of music did you listen to growing up? The Definitely the oldest station around here, 105.1 KOSP. It still plays in my brain, even though it's not a station wow. anymore. But all those oldies, like really enthralled me from a young age. And then I didn't start paying attention to what was happening like modern and what was happening in the real world or current times until like probably fifth or sixth grade. I was like, oh, okay, there's music happening now too. It's not all the Beatles and the Beach Boys. Right. So that was definitely my wheelhouse as I was growing up was all the 60s and 70s sort of stuff. Did growing up in rural communities, would you say that shaped your music you play now? I would say subconsciously. It's funny. I used to like be all like, I'm from California. You know, I was born there. Right. So my birth certificate says I used to have this thing about that. And then I realized how silly that is because <laughs> the Ozarks are awesome, you know, and I am sure. definitely a product of the Ozarks because I've lived here for as long as I've been conscious, you know, right. aware of everything around me. I would definitely say that the music I play is inspired. I play more country sounding stuff. I grew up listening to like, after I got into like more modern stuff, I fell into like punk rock and all the hard rock stuff. I was really into Tony Hawk games. So I, I, I fell into oh, all yeah. the punk rock on those <laughs> soundtracks and stuff and kind of rejected the whole idea of like country music for the longest time growing up. It was really silly, but there's the whole genre of like 90s country. I, I hardly know any country right. just completely missed it and now I go back and I listen to it and I'm like this stuff's great but um, growing up kind of around that I guess I see it seeped into me and now I play really country leaning stuff like I call it Cosmic Ozarkana but oh I love that <laughs> silly name. everything's got to have a name though right so I figured for I might sure. as well put a name on it and um, I'm from here so uh, would you mind playing something that's yeah, Cosmic absolutely. Ozarkana uh, I will there's a song I wrote about turning into a tree. I, I guess that's kind of Cosmic Ozarkana. It's called No Gravestone.
Sorry for yelling at you. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry I'm a one-woman audience. No, you're <laughs> I can't good. cheer very loud. <laughs> um, so how did you start playing instruments? So um, I was really into skateboarding. Like I said, I grew up playing those Tony Hawk games. Right. And then um, I was riding my bike to my friend's house, and I got hit by a truck. What? So I couldn't skateboard for a while. I skateboard oh, again gosh. now. But, um, after all that happened, I was kind of confined in a wheelchair for a little over six weeks. Wow. And I was bored as heck, and I had to do something. So I started playing guitar. I just That happened in August before I went into eighth grade, and um, that would have been, I think I got my first guitar like two months before that. So it's, wow. it's weird, but I guess getting hit by a truck was a really good thing for me to have happen to me. I mean, really good timing if you just got <laughs> a guitar. If it's going to happen. I mean, yeah, you know, it worked out. And then after that, I was I started messing around. I had some friends that played. And in Nevada, where I grew up, there was actually a really cool little music scene. We had a little community where we would rent out the uh, Days In conference room there off the highway, and we would, like, pack it full of, like, high school kids, and we'd play rock and roll in there. And there was a couple of really good bands from that era that I wish would have made CDs or records or something. But really? Yeah, it was a cool little scene. I feel like there's probably a lot of those hidden in the pockets of these hills around here. Oh, for sure. Um, and that's a little music scene you wouldn't think of being in a small town. Yeah. A little rock scene. And we had a little bar where we would uh, house to open, or I would go to the open jam there, and that's really where I started cutting my teeth. This place called Shooters, where I was like 17. And I just like kind of went in through the back door. Once they heard me play, they let me stick around, even though I wasn't old enough to be there. And, yeah. And then I just started kind of soaking all of it up like a sponge, you know. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. What kind of like format was that? Oh, it was just kind of a. Um, it's similar to the one that I host now, where it's just kind of a kind of a casual, loose feel. Like I think my buddy Doug Harper was hosting it back then, where he would, where people would just show up and sign up on the list and. If you needed accompaniment, somebody would probably know how to play bass or drums and join you. And lately, I've been hosting an open mic night. I've done it at a few different places. Right now, it's at Mother's, but um, it's a lot of fun, too, for the same reason, where like people can get up and just kind of accompany people. And I kind of model it after that experience, because that was so integral for me, falling in love with music and learning how to like do it in like a util utilitarian fashion and follow other people and all that. Just out of curiosity, like what style of playing and musicians do you see come into your open mic night? All kinds. Really? It's crazy. Like, because people will see it online, and there was this one guy that came from like Wisconsin one time. He sounded exactly like Garth Brooks. What? And like, there's we'll get people from all sorts of different sectors of the country that are passing through. Well, they'll just see you. there's an open mic night in town. And, for a while, we did a we had a really good run at the cellar before it closed here in town where we would host it and um, now we're at Mother's but when we were hosting at the cellar it was a lot of fun we would have like all sorts of people because it was a weekly thing and we're bi-weekly right now every other week what? on Sundays but it was a lot of fun um, all sorts of different players um, every night was totally different you never know who might come in there could be like a total like legend in the scene wow. and you're just like wow I'm I, it was actually how I got to play with a lot of the people that I, I kind of like cut my teeth around here looking up to and now it's like wow we're sharing a stage right now and like you're playing solo while I'm playing like chords and holy crap you know it's it's crazy just to all the osmosis of the scene around here is really cool to just be a part of oh yeah witness I could ramble about it forever <laughs> it's fantastic um you have such a unique style as a solo musician that you've developed, how did this kind of all come about? Um, well, I started out playing, um, I started out singing in a metal band. And then, um, and that was, that was before I, I had started writing songs, but I wasn't super good at it yet. And the other guy in the band wrote all the lyrics, except for like one exception where I kind of helped with stuff. But I was still like, I played guitar, but I wasn't like confident enough mm -hmm. beyond like just doing acoustic stuff. And then that happened for a couple of years, and then I moved to Champaign, Illinois for about two years, because um, my parents lived there after Nevada and all that, they moved out that way. And 
while I was out there, I started busking a lot on the street because there is a lot of different places. And I guess I sort of got the mentality of like reading an area and like figuring out like what people would want to hear really from doing all of that. And then I, I traveled a lot and we would busk and we went through like Asheville, North Carolina, stayed there for a couple of weeks just playing on the street corners. It's like 10 years ago now. It's crazy to think, but <clears throat> it was definitely, uh, I think that definitely helped develop sort of the vibe that I have, sort of this kind of vagabondy thing I go for, I guess. Uh, yes. It's so unique. Um, Thank you. <clears throat> definitely Shaky Graves, too, is an influence, if you know who that uh -uh. is. Uh-uh. Tell me about he was the first guy that I saw do something similar to this, where he's got a suitcase and he had a tambourine. And his situation's a little different because I used the license plate as sort of yeah. the snare drum. And, and that was honestly just an accident. That really? It, it just worked out that way. I just sort of had an idea. For a while I was using a wooden beater and now this has just fallen apart. And honestly the only thing making the thwack noise is the actual like, the thing that holds the beater isn't even there anymore. <laughs> but it still makes the noise, yeah. so it's fine. I'm, I, for a while, I was leaving so many wood chips everywhere I'd go, because <laughs> the license plate would eat them up. But it's definitely a work in progress, and I'm constantly like rebuilding this thing. Oh, that's so fun. <laughs> it's, it's a trip. I can't believe it's, it's, where, it's taking me where I am, you know? Yeah. Looks like you've got another song. Well, uh, talking about busking in Asheville, yeah. it reminded me of this time that um, we were out there and we met this guy, and his name was Chance McClary, and um, he uh, he's this cool dude. He walks up and he's got like sunglasses on. It's like midnight, by the way, <laughs> and and like he's like you could tell he he looks like James Dean if he never died in a car crash. You right. know, and he just like oozes cool. So he walks over and and we jam for a little while. We've got probably like. 10 hippies doing a street corner symphony or whatever in the middle of Asheville. And this guy walks up and we're jamming some blues and then we just get to talking about life for a while. And he tells me about his time in the Vietnam War and how he lost his brother. Oh, I guess it's not a normal thing for relatives to be in the same platoon, but that was the case for him and his brother. And um, he lost his brother and the way that he told me the story about it, and it is stuck with me. And, it's probably like a year or two later before I actually wrote the song about it, and I don't know whatever happened to him or where he's at, if he's still around. Or I looked for him online, but I didn't have any luck. And for the longest time, I misheard his name um, as McLaren, but it was actually McClary because I had a friend go to the uh, Vietnam Wall and found his brother's name on the wall. And uh, that's what the song's called. It's called Name Upon a Wall. <clears throat> Gordon carried his guns In a war we never won He choked down his final breath In his brother's own caress And one day I met the man Who had Gordon in his hands When his blood was spilled in vain his bitter fingers point the blame at our blind society and all the shepherds to the sheep who had the audacity to lie when they said God was on our side and 50 years before today amongst the bullets and the blades Gordon McClary once stood tall Now that's just a name upon a wall There's no word that could describe All the pain behind his
name upon a wall a name upon a wall a name upon a wall What a powerful song. Thank you. And the song that unfortunately many can relate to. Man. That, was, that one's really fun at parties. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Way to bring um, down the room, everybody. Right. Um, yeah, that's a heart wrencher. Um, out of curiosity, what places were the best to best to busk at? <laughs> there was a spot. Um, honestly, Asheville was really cool. Really. Back then, and I've been told since that it was like. And I don't know, I'm not a local there, but every time we've been there since, it's not been nearly as fun. Really? Yeah. Well, and I think it's just because there's so many people that go there now. Yeah. And, like, the, the tourists kind of ruined that place, and I don't want to, like, help ruin it by showing up there all the time. Right. Because the last time I was there, like, it was, everybody was so nice the first time, but I think people are kind of sick of everybody. Of tourism. Yeah, gentrifying their city. Right. Which I get, but, um. Back in 2013, Asheville was a heck of a fun place to busk. And then I would do it outside of the Blind Pig and Champagne a lot. I over here, I did it for a while in the South Street Tunnel. Yeah? Yeah, and it's actually really funny. There's this documentary I would recommend anybody watching this that cares about Springfield music called The Center of Nowhere that this guy named Dave, and I don't know how to say his, Hostra, I don't know how to say his last name, but... Anyway, super nice guy. I met him, but he was filming a documentary about Lou Whitney and like Springfield Sound and all these people that played in bands like the Skeletons and all that yeah. from around here. And um, in the process of him filming that video or filming the documentary, I was actually busking in the South Street Tunnel. And there's like a 10 second clip of me. You can't hear what I'm doing. Thank goodness. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm in that, that documentary. Springfield music busking at the That's South Street Tunnel. Mm. Probably singing about beer money or something. <laughs> Glad I quit drinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, what differences have you seen like playing in Springfield and then playing, you know, on the East Coast or where what other kind of places have you played at? I would say that playing in Springfield or playing around here in the yeah. Ozarks, I think that and it might just be because I'm comfortable here. I can play, like, enough, I've played around here enough that I can see somebody I know at most of my shows. Yeah. Which is a super awesome, very comfortable feeling. Um, and, like, sometimes when I play other places, it can almost be, like, fun to have that. No one knows anything about me. Mm -hmm. I can, like, all the songs that I've played, like, 300 times in the Springfield area... I play them in like, you know, Kingman, Arizona or Santa Fe or anywhere and, um, you know, it's just different, you know, people haven't heard me do this song 20 times and, and it's a cool, it's a fresh experience, but I, you know, comparatively, um, I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm still trying to make my circle around this whole area a little bigger each time I go out. So, I mean, it's a process, but there's definitely nothing quite like playing in the Ozarks. For sure. I'm a big fan of the area. So. That's fantastic. Do you think there's a difference in like reception to your music, if that makes sense? Does the crowd react differently? Yeah, I would say definitely. Um, in certain areas, I um, I don't know. Sometimes I call it I call them wallpaper gigs, because like um, essentially people are just talking over me the whole time. Right. And those are everywhere. Those are here. Those are there. Those are everywhere. Um, you know, and sometimes it's, it'll grate on me a little, mm -hmm. but I mean, I'm still so lucky just that I get to go play music and just, that's what I'm doing. I don't have to like do it on the side or something. That's the main focus. It's really, awesome. it's exciting. But I would say that I think people care more about music here than other places. And again, I'm biased because people, I'm more familiar here than other places you know yeah. so like, I'm I'm gonna have a more cushy experience playing here than I might in some faraway place where no one knows me or, yeah you know but 
I still you, crave that, though. Do you think the Ozarks has a relatively big music scene? I would say so. I would say definitely, especially, like, if you look at it from not only what's happening currently, but from a historical standpoint with, like, the Ozark Jubilee and, like, the Philharmonics and the Skeletons and all these, like, bands from around here that... And, like, the, the digger that I've dug in the history of our culture and the scene and the music that has come from here or was inspired by here the more I've found like connections to faraway places and other things that I never would have thought like I don't know the first example that comes to my mind is there's a picture of Paul McCartney wearing an Ozark Mountain Daredevil shirt and there's so many cool like connections between here and other places that I uh I like that stuff it's cool to see Sorry, did I did I answer your question? Correctly? Yeah, oh, perfectly, cool. for sure. Let me think. Um, I guess I should play another song. That would be great. Um, here's a song I wrote called uh, "Strange Duality." Kind of about that feeling, the overwhelming feeling of being human sometimes. Mm. Wow. 
I'm so impressed at like the versatility of all of your songs that you write. Thank you. I mean, I try not to write the same song twice. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, you had mentioned before I started running the camera that your mom was a jeweler. Yeah. And that you guys went to a lot of festivals when you were growing up. We did. We, every like small town around here has their annual thing where everyone shows up on the square and like sells their stuff and all that and um, we would kind of go on tour in a way all around all these little tiny towns from like Shell Knob to you know Galena and all these different places where we would sell my mom's jewelry. My dad would sell my mom's jewelry and I was kind of the free range child that <laughs> wandered around and just explored all these random little towns around here. It was, it was honestly looking back at it it was a really cool way to like familiarize myself with this area and yeah. fall in love with it. The, the, the more that I came to age and realized how cool what we've got going on around here is. For sure. Was there a lot of music at these festivals? There was some. It it honestly was later that I really kind of started paying attention. Yeah. Because I was more focused on like trying to find, I was an only child till I was nine, so I was like focused on like trying to find friends and <laughs> all that stuff. But, um, and then by the time my brothers came along, we weren't doing the jewelry stuff as much. But because I have two brothers, one's um, nine years younger than me, and one's fifteen years oh, younger wow. than me. So, but um, yeah, we would go all over. So, bluegrass and country music and old time music it was pretty common around here, and I know back in the day. Arguably, it was the most prevalent. Yeah. Um, would you say that's still the case? I would say that there's a somewhat of a, I would call it a new grass revival going on. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely, I mean, like with the, the popularity of like Billy Strings and like all of that stuff, I've noticed. I, uh, I one of the festivals we did go, or my parents did sell jewelry at, was a place I can forget. It was like Montauk, somewhere over here. Like I remember it was like a three hour drive. Wow. Hated it as a kid. I bet. <laughs> but um, we would get there and I remember there was all this bluegrass and there was a whole stage and it was like, a, and that was honestly my first experience listening to bluegrass. And I remember my dad who didn't like country, but he liked bluegrass. And I remember there's a difference. And that was really that right. big, you know, cause it's like you, when I was a child, I just associated both genres with like the idea of twang and, all that closed-minded stuff but then like I remember distinctly being at that festival in Montauk and I was probably like eight or something and like I remember hearing just this guy shredding on a banjo and I was like this is like Iron Maiden but it's a <laughs> banjo and like in a different context but it's still that same like super energetic like get up and go kind of feeling you get from exciting music and I was like I get it now right I totally get it it's and that was a big moment for me. I would say that in terms of everybody, I would say, I don't know, I feel like the old ways aren't going anywhere, especially around here, really. Yeah. I think that hopefully, I mean, there'll always be bluegrass being played somewhere. Yeah. But I think it's more popular than it was even 10 years ago now. Agreed. It seems like there's... Um it's more of an open genre than it once was. Yeah, I've noticed that some of the traditionalists are a little more, um, you know, reluctant to change. Right. But, I mean, I get it too. It's like, there's this whole thing about country music back in the 50s whenever rock was starting to kind of like take over and all of a sudden there wasn't anywhere for country people to play because all the venues catered to rock and roll as it became popular, so. For sure. There's this whole thing to keep country music country. Right. And now all the genres are so, like, it's inevitable. It's all going to, like, look at Old Town Road, you know? <gasps> yeah. It's like eight genres at once, and it's somehow it's called country. I mean, maybe it kind of is. I don't know. Yeah. According to the Billboard charts. <laughs> Certainly. Um, keep the rap out of country is what people say all the time. <laughs> people are afraid of change. People are afraid of change. I am too sometimes, I get it. Oh yeah, everybody is, <laughs> certainly. If you see 
what you do is perfect, then there's no improving perfection. Um, would you say bluegrass and old time music at those festivals? Did it have any effect on the music you play today? I would say um, what really made me fall in love with bluegrass mm -hmm. and folk music and like get serious about it was my time in Champaign because I started um, hanging out with some of the people that go to this festival called Muddy Roots. Okay. And it's a really, it's a, and um, I went to the Spring Weekender Muddy Roots thing. It was like a music festival. And I just went as a, a guest, and like I met so many cool musicians, a lot of people that I ended up playing shows with later and stuff. But just like seeing like all these different bands from, and that whole circuit is really tight. Like you'd see yeah. like if you know like fifteen of those people, then you then you know like two hundred people across the country basically, you know. Right. And and I I got to know some of those folks and get into that scene a little bit. And there's just there was a spot in Kansas City called the Westport Saloon for a while where people would play, and I got to play there one time, but that was another part of that whole circuit. But I got to play in Pekin, Illinois, at a place called The High Note, and I opened up for Lydia Loveless, and a couple other different shows where, and I guess, I don't know, just going to all these shows with my friends that I met over there really got me into to liking folk music, and um, I don't know, there's like a, a sort of a punk mentality to the way that they do it but they still play like the traditional like yeah. folky bluegrass stuff and I uh, definitely related to that from like the way that I grew up with the skateboarding and all that whole culture so it was cool to kind of bridge all that together in a way but um, yeah I'd say folk music when I finally started writing songs it just happened to be folk music right um, if there's I'll probably play one more song or however many but one of the songs that I will play for sure before we're done, if it's the last one, is um, probably the first, like, good song I ever wrote, I guess I would say. <laughs> like, at least that I'm, like, okay with putting my name on and, like, throwing out there into the ether. And I wrote it about 11 years ago um, about living out of a car. And I was not listening to folk music, really. I liked Iron and Wine. I would fall asleep listening to Iron and Wine and, like, indie folk stuff. Right. But, like, I had not gotten into the the good stuff yet, you know. What would you say is the good stuff? Oh, Tom T. Hall is the first thing that comes to mind right now. But so good. I didn't know who Tom T. Hall or George Jones was back then, you know. And, um, you know, I'm still learning every day. There's so much music to listen to and absorb. So I, I, uh, I hope to never, I hope to never stop finding new stuff every day. For sure. It's a lot of fun to explore, both sonically and in the real world. Definitely. I think that's all the questions I have for you. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? Um, I am, I have music out there. Um, I have a record called Nowhere is a Place. That's what this song I'm about to play is called. Um, and it was recorded over the course of four years. Um, it started out as sort of a fun little project in my friend's basement. And then from there, um, we took some of those tracks and then I got busy with my gig schedule. This is like 2017. And then COVID happened. Everyone lost their gigs for a while. Mm -hmm. And we, me and my friend Chad Graves picked back up on recording and we took some of those old tracks. There's two songs on the record from those old sessions. And then we like kind of built upon them. We started getting all these different people involved because like, sort of from like doing the jam I got to know some of these players that I've always looked up to and when everybody lost their gigs for a while no one was doing anything and I was like hey you guys want to come over to Gravy's Ranch and record some like parts <laughs> on these songs and I got like so many people I look up to involved in it and I listen oh, to it now amazing. I don't listen to it very often but when I do I'm like how the heck do these how, how did I get all these people involved uh, like like Molly Healy from the Ozark Mountain, Dare, Mountain Daredevils and Kelly Brown from the Skeletons, all these like really legendary people that right. lent their time and talents. But anyway, that's on on my website on Spotify. I've got a live record on my website that's not on Spotify, oh, justinmarkinmusic.com. Cool. Um, Do you have any gigs you're really excited about this year? I have a few. I'm playing um, I'm playing the State Fair in Ohio. Super random. Oh, that's so fun. Yeah, I'm. Uh, 
I just got back from my tour that I was really excited about, and now I'm like, what now? But I'm planning a new one where I want to go out west to California to see my grandparents because they live out there. Mm -hmm. So uh, that one will be exciting. I've booked as far as Taos. I've got a show in Taos in June. And that's a cool town if you've never been out that way. Mm -hmm. Hippie cowboy town. But yeah, I'm excited. Gonna live out of my car for a little bit. It's kind of the subject matter of this one. Well, I was planning every morning for the rest of my days. Waking to the sunrise, casting light upon your face. That ain't me.
Thanks for having me. This yeah, was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. It has been a lot of fun. And that that's the title track of your album? Yeah, no, where is the place? Sweet. Check it out, everybody. Check it out. And this has been another edition of Songs of the Ozarks. Thank sure. you so much, Justin. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. A lot of fun.